Hi y'all, in this video I'm going to be responding to part of a video done by Lacey Green titled um, How Many Freaking Genders? Hi Lacey, I understand you've been getting a little bit of the red pill lately, so uh, congratulations. I'm trying to extend some good faith here, but as I've learned from feminists, uh, people who demand good faith be extended are speaking from a position of privilege, and I wouldn't want to get into a privilege debate because obviously mine needs to be checked. Oh, I mean, hello. So anyway, you're going to talk a little bit about um, the anti-feminism gender as biology argument, and I'm going to let you speak for a minute and then respond to it. Uh, but just to put you on notice, there are two large-scale strains of people from your side of the aisle, for want of a better uh, way to phrase it, in respect of science. One uh, is the people who are just not educated in science, they're scientifically illiterate, and you know, whatever they read on BuzzFeed that says there's a study which simply just links to some other news article that was an opinion by some blogger or whatever, they go, oh, that's what science says. QED. Uh, go home, everybody. So that's one, one group. And the other group are the people who uh, are educated in science but have a political narrative that they want to push and therefore dissemble. So you, in two major strains, you have imbeciles on one side or the unlettered folks on one side and the smart dishonest people on the other, and that's what makes extending you good faith here a little bit hard, other than the privilege joke I made earlier. But nevertheless, I will give it a polite go, so take it away. So I asked those of you who feel like there's only two genders to share why, and 53% of you told me there's only two genders because of biology. You know, there's male, female, XY, XX, and it's not a complicated issue, this is fairly straightforward and so on and so forth, logically. Now, here's where you're going to run into a problem. You're going to start talking logic, and you're not really going to be getting into logic. I think what you mean by logic is what most people mean by logic, which is that this sounds reasonable to me, and I'll just say that it's therefore logical, even if it isn't. And this isn't an insult. Uh, it's just not logical what you're doing. And, and this, even if it were, um, this isn't logic because it's science. Logic is important to science, but uh, how empiricism is what drives science. Um, you use mathematics to create models which are then tested against what actually happens in reality and then you compare what happened in reality against the model and revise the model and revise and you iterate that process and you create knowledge. Biology is very hard to pin down because of the, you know, it is just an expression of physics at, at but because there are so many variables, it's really, really hard to do. You know, let's walk through this. In its purest interpretation, gender equals biology implies that all of the differences that we see between men and women in society are ultimately the product of our bodies. You know, we're they are ultimately the product of our bodies. Uh, what you're describing here is the phenotype. The phenotype is the expression of the genotype in an environment. It is the biological facts about an organism as they uh, interplay with the environment in which the organism is embedded. And the way that evolution works is differential adaptive, repro differential reproductive uh, success. So that's where you get adaptations, you get variations, allele frequencies in a population. People aren't interchangeable, they're not identical, they have subtle variations, and over time, you know, you get more of one type of trait and uh, less of another type of trait, and you get a little bit of flux in there. It's very difficult to pin down. Slaves to our bodies, in a sense, and um, our social environment doesn't, you know, play a hand in shaping who we are. If biology alone creates... The environment shapes, or that's what we adapt to, is the environment. So it's, it's just not an accurate statement of biology to say that the environment plays no role. We adapt to our environment. When the environment puts a pressure on a population, the populations that fail to adapt to uh, whatever these pressures are, uh, that fail to adapt to it as well as other organisms in, in the same niche, die off. Those populations go extinct and then you're left with some population that has a particular distribution of traits. And then they are now competing in that environment. And so you, you get this, this variation, and you are going to, as you're going to point out here, you see a lot of variation. It's the differences between <clears throat> men and women. These differences should be universal throughout the human species, across 
every culture. And it would also be constant throughout. That would be true if and only if it were the case that uh, people were identical. But they aren't. You know, people don't have all of the same genes. They don't have all of the same DNA. They don't have, you know, they don't have all of that uh, between one person and the next. So you're not going to expect that kind of thing. It... Straight, because biology, sex is the same all over the world. But when I look at the world, that's not what I see. I do see some variation. I see some common themes, some things that seem to be pretty widespread, but there are also a lot of differences too between cultures when it comes to gender and certainly throughout history. How do we account for cultures where the gender roles are completely swapped? How do we account for cultures where there are three, four, even five genders? I mean, I'm not... There are no cultures where there are that many genders. There are cultures where people claim that there are that many genders. Now, what you're doing here is an elementary po uh, problem in science, and if scientists actually operated in the way that you're doing, we would never ever make any progress. You have taken an idealized model, reduced it down to its simplest terms, and then uh, pointed out in the real world that the real world doesn't model this uh, conjectured model that you have uh, thrown out, and then you're using that fact to negate the model. So suppose that physics operated this way, you know, oh, those Newtonian mechanics, they're just wrong. Uh, gravity is just wrong because, you know, gravity says, and this is when you get a physics test or physical science test for people who didn't study to be scientists, uh, you'll get something like um, some objects are falling and then it'll be like ignore air resistance or in a vacuum or something like that. That's the ideal model where you don't have to take into account other factors, environmental factors that are in fact uh, extant on Earth. And so you have this idealized model that you can model very well mathematically. So you take a, a bowling ball and a golf ball. Gravity says they should be accelerated by the same rate from the objects that are acting on it, you know, down towards the gravity well. That model would be rejected if I adopted your way of ana uh, analyzing this by simply uh, using a feather and a bowling ball and noting that, well, the feather is not accelerating at the same rate the bowling ball is, therefore the gravitational law is wrong. But it isn't. It's just that there's air resistance to factor in now, so you have to factor that in. And then, you know, you've got to fact, you, which is really hard to do, by the way, the precise moment-to-moment -moment air resistance bearing on a feather as it falls, it's just very difficult to do. Take, let's take something uh, simpler. Um, pendulums are very easy to model. They're very easy. But one thing that becomes instantly mathematically intractable is if you take one pendulum, link it to another pendulum, uh, and then let it go completely unpredictable. It's not that there's any violation in the laws of physics. It's not that Newtonian mechanics are wrong. It's not any of that. It's just that it's very sensitive to its initial conditions and the forces that act on it. And so if you have two double pendulums, they won't behave in exactly the same way, even though if you had two regular pendulums side by side, they would almost perfectly mirror one another if they're sufficiently close. Not true with the double pendulum, because you have tidal forces that operate on everything on Earth. You have, uh, you'll have different moments with respect to the center of gravity and the rotation of the Earth. So you've got to factor in the conservation of momentum in addition to gravity, in addition to tidal uh, forces that act on it. Uh, you've got to factor all of that in. And then there are much more minor things. The air resistance over here is going to be changed by the pendulum spinning a little bit over here, possibly. The viscosity of the oils that are used in the joint may be heated differently and therefore will have a different level, a slightly different level of viscosity as the pendulums go through their little whack-a-mole um, motions. And it makes it very, very, actually makes it impossible for us to predict, even though we know that there is absolutely no uh, contradiction between what we see happening in the real world and the model, because we understand that the models are approximations. They're not absolutes. They aren't universal, contrary to what you said should be implied. If it were strictly logical and you had only one variable, uh, what you said would make sense. You'd have to do a little bit more work, but putting that off to the side, what you, would, what you have said would make sense. But that isn't what people mean. They're saying that the ensemble differences that you see between the two uh, sexes are a function of our biology, and they are perfectly correct. The ensemble differences between men and women uh, well, take height, for example. Men, on average, are taller than women are, on average. Some women are taller than some men. 
that does not mean that there's any problem with biology. It doesn't mean that this woman is thereby more mannish because she happens to be taller than some male, any more than it means that a male that is taller than another male is somehow more manly. Um, so you have a spectrum of ways that the phenotype can exist, but they're constrained. And <clears throat> by what are they constrained? Our biology, in the same way that our physical abilities are constrained by our biology. No matter uh, how much I want to say that I can fly unaided by machinery, I can't do it. There is a hard limit beyond which I simply cannot go in respect of getting airborne. And that is uh, determined by, well, that pesky law of gravity I mentioned earlier, and my biology. Let's take some other, other definitions in biology and, and see how they, they play out. Take the definition of a species. After all of the research has been done and the millions of species that have been discovered, <clears throat> we still do not have a really great definition that, uh, of what a species is that encompasses all the things we want it to encompass, excludes all the things that we want it to exclude, and not have any you know, outliers or oddities in the system. Um, for example, polar bears and brown bears are classified as two species, even though they are, in fact, uh, the same species. Uh, you know, they can interbreed in nature, and they do interbreed in nature. And the reason that this remains the case is because the, the arc of evolution is very long, and you get subtle uh, gradations as you go through. The allele frequencies change over long periods of time, and there's not been an adequately long period of time in which these two populations have been sufficiently well separated to make them no longer uh, capable of interbreeding and producing fertile offspring. So too at the genus level, we don't have a good definition, a great definition for that. So too at the family level, it's not until I think you get up to the order where you, everything that you want to encompass is encompassed, and nothing that you don't want to be encompassed is encompassed. So it excludes everything you want it to exclude, so far as we know so far, and includes all the things that you want it to. It would, it would be a fundamental treachery to science and human intellect to say that because you have these oddities, because of incomplete speciation events, that therefore speciation doesn't happen. That's the evolutionist uh, proposition. I'm sorry, the creationist proposition that because... Anyway, I'm not going to get into the creation evolution debate. <laughs> That'll be just crazy. You cannot reject the general model by pointing out that there are exceptions to it because the, one of the underlying tenets of science is that the laws are not absolute. Nothing in nature is absolute. Uh, you will get variation. So when someone says gender as biology, that gender is a function of biology, that doesn't mean you won't get variations. And when you see those variations, they do not contradict the proposition. Take, for example, the defining features of what makes a human. One of them is our large brain. Nevertheless, there are children who are born anencephalic. They are born without a brain. Does that mean they're not human? No. Of course it doesn't mean they're not human when they're born without a brain. It means that they are dead. It means that there is a defect somewhere along there. You have a, an, a variation of such extreme that the organism can no longer survive. The differences that you get in the complement of traits uh, between men and women, where some women have traits that are more, more closely associated with males and some men have traits that are more closely associated with women, doesn't mean that you have created a third gender you have just found a more extreme variation on the general model. You have not found something that contradicts the model and you have not found a new model. You have just, you're just you know, on a bell curve, you've just gone further out to the extremes. It's still a function of biology. <clears throat> now, some people want to take those exceptions and make them super duper extra special and then say, because I have a right to identify myself in the way that you know, blows my skirt up, that therefore that imposes upon everybody else an obligation to play along with my definition of what I am. And indeed, all of science has to be remade to, uh, to accommodate, all of biology has to be remade to accommodate this because I care about it really, really, really strongly and it deeply affects me right in my feels. No. People are free to define themselves however they want. Choose whatever labels do it for you and knock yourself out. The problem that arises is that that is not enough for that side. They cannot be made happy. No capitulation that you could possibly make, real or imagined, no capitulation, 
will ever satisfy these people. They are incapable of being satisfied even if you give them everything that they want because the moment you do that, they're just going to come up with some finer, uh, more reticulated variation on it and say, well, now we've got a new thing that you have to accept. It is a never, uh, the, the goalpost is never sat still for very long. It is always being moved around. They're playing Calvin ball with science. And if in my own life, if uh, you know someone wants to go by a female, uh, you know, set of pronouns or whatever, even though they're male, and they're a reasonably cordial person, I don't have a problem with it so long as they're not trying to tell, dictate to me, that I must agree and accept this. I do it as a courtesy, not as a statement of science. But when you get into the actual science, there are in fact only two sexes, and therefore there are only two genders. What you get are variations. Variations do not a new creation, uh, do not a new uh, gender create for the same reason that a baby born without a brain does not create a new species. In the same way that we are bi bipedal organisms, doesn't mean that a person who has had his uh, leg lopped off in some kind of stray accident suddenly becomes a new uh, subspecies of human. It becomes, it, it remains the exact same species of human with a defect. Same thing with people who have gender dysphoria. They have a disorder. It alters their perception. I have a great deal of sympathy for them. That must be very terrible to go through. But it does not create a new gender. Have a great day.